Okay, and welcome back again to In the War Room. Ryan Ray here again. This time we are going to all the way to what's in the news, if you're following internationally, over to Hong Kong with Joshua Wong, who is kind of everywhere right now. Uh, we'll link to his Twitter and um, profile so you can go, go check out what's going on there. Uh, Joshua, thank you for coming on. It is 2 a.m. here in the States, uh, Friday morning, so it's 3 p.m. Hong Kong time. Um, for folks who went to bed Thursday night, they kind of had seen the, the 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 new laws that passed. We'll get to that in a second. But let's kind of walk back maybe with the last six months. Um, mm. I was in China last fall, last November, um, right before Thanksgiving time here. And what we saw was it felt like the Hong Kong protests were kind of dying down on some level. Um, of course, with the COVID outbreak, the Hong Kong protests um, – in the states, haven't gotten maybe the, the the kind of the coverage of the news they were getting last fall. Kind of walk us back to the last six months. Um, what role, if any, the COVID outbreak has played with the protest? Uh, did you guys kind of slack off because of that? Um, and are y'all concerned about the COVID outbreak? Um, you know, wh why the protests are picking back up? Uh, so after the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 almost end in Hong Kong because the number of confirmed cases dropped to zero. Uh, is a critical timing that we mobilize people, take back to the street again. And uh, under the crackdown and the hotline uh, suppression from Beijing, especially the implementation of the national security law turned Hong Kong from one country, two system to one country, one system with kind of speech crime might be executed in Hong Kong soon, um, which is the situation of now or never. Yeah, and, and so it feels like the, the question that I've kind of been pondering here um, from just from the outsider's perspective is obviously there's a lot of pressure on Beijing from obviously the U.S. government and you see the European governments, um, African governments are putting a lot of pressure um, whether or not they lied or uh, whatever you want to think about, about the origin of the virus. There, there's a lot of pressure being put on them from the international community. Um, do you feel like maybe the, the crackdown on Hong Kong is being used as a, a leverage, a bargaining chip, if you will, so they can um, almost put pressure on Hong Kong, but then later on maybe – roll that back so they can get get relief from some of this international pressure because obviously hong kong is a, is a story um, that gets a lot of attention here and so um it, it, it's interesting that that now is the time that the uh, communist chinese party has uh, decided to kind of roll out these new measures um now it's hong kong and the next is taiwan and later on is the rest of the world by under the threat of china hong kong people stand in the forefront to confront the authoritarian crackdown uh from beijing and uh, now it's about democracy versus autocracy. So um, no doubt how Beijing is taking advantage during the outbreak of coronavirus, but it doesn't mean that the world keeps silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so from your perspective, I, I saw it, uh, on, on Twitter, you were, I know President Trump has, by the time this comes out, will have already spoken. Um, what, what, what do you think the U.S. response should be to um, the, the leaders in Beijing, what, what is, it, is it sanctions? Is it military threat? Um, you know, how far should the U.S. go, in your opinion, to kind of um, curtail some of the actions we're seeing from um, from Beijing? Uh, according to uh, the recommendation of Secretary Pompeo, uh, I uh, and lots of fellow Hong Kongers urged President Trump echo on it and to execute the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act with further a uh, sanction mechanism to put pressure on Beijing, no matter partial economic sanction or uh, the embargo of dual-use technology or sensitive equipment, those are the option and the way out uh, to, should be considered by the White House. Mm -hmm. And so um, Hong Kong, when you, when, you go, when you go to China, uh, one of the things that, uh, at least when you're in the uh, mainland China, they say is you know, the, the one country, two systems. Um, from the Hong Kong perspective, um, obviously you are, you are fighting to preserve that mentality. Um, and it started with the extradition bill, seeing what kind of flared stuff up last year. Now we have the new security laws. Um, did you feel like this was um, something that was ever going to be molded together, or are we – experiencing these these um the, the, these flare-ups because hong kong wants to be more uh you know more of a democracy more of a free enterprise type society and uh, beijing's just not ready for that is it something that was ever going to work out um in, in your opinion or um do you think eventually maybe that, that the one country two systems model could have been a little bit more um, um uh, work, work together in a better way uh 
which how Hong Kongers and the global community should realize uh, Beijing broke the promise in the Sino-British Joint Declaration when they could appoint secret police from Beijing to arrest people in Hong Kong and the prosecution and trial might take place in China, uh, mainland China instead of Hong Kong. Those also imply high degree autonomy exists in name and within this uh, battle, um, which is really the, the critical timing and and a challenging period for us, but I'm still optimistic that uh, to encourage more world alliance to stand with Hong Kong. Yeah, and, and, and on that note, one of the things um, from the from the Hong Kong perspective again, I'm curious about is you see a lot of folks like yourself. I'm I'm 34, I believe you are 23, 24, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, um, so you see a lot of young people that are out um, leading the protest, at least from the coverage we get here in the States, um, is this more of a, a youth movement or is this um, just the way the coverage is perceived here stateside? Um, since last summer, more than 8,000 people were arrested. The youngest man is at the age of 11, the oldest one at the age of 84. So not mm. only a, okay. a youngster joined the young movement, is also engaged by yeah. elderly and loss of generation of baby boomers. Mm. Okay. And... Uh, you know, on that note, one of the things you, you look at the, the protest, obviously you're taking an economic toll because you can't work. Um, you know, there's there's other shops that I guess can't be open. And, and you mentioned that the, the secret police here. How has this day to day life changed for you guys over these last you know six to eight months where um, you have a secret police? I'm not exactly sure, you know, how that even works itself out practically. If, if you're if you're afraid to go out and say anything in public, if you're not protesting, you're just trying to you know, go get a snack. Um, and, and what has been the economic toll just from having to worry about, um, you know, uh, crackdowns from Beijing? Um, since last summer, uh, we are the ones who experienced uh, water cannons, tear gas, and uh, rubber bullet uh, weeks by weeks. Uh, we never imagined high school students could be fired by a life round, and lots of our fellow protesters might be arrested and locked up in prison in Hong Kong. But once the national security law uh, execute in Hong Kong, we might not be jailed in Hong Kong anymore. And the worst scenario is to be jailed in Beijing. Yeah, and see, I think that was missed on a lot of Americans. That's what really seemed to uh, uh, flare things up last year was this extradition case. And it was kind of, from my understanding, kind of a, a weird situation that brought it about. But but that's kind of walk, walk through why that is such a big fear for someone over here who might not understand, you know, being extradited from Hong Kong to Beijing and why that would be such a concern. Uh, kind of maybe explain some of the legal issues that you might face if you were extradited into uh, to Beijing. Uh, when we were extradited to Beijing, Beijing is the place without fair trial and without judicial independence, and the communist regime could override the decision of the court in Beijing. But in Hong Kong, we still have a uh, sort of judicial independence, and the legal framework in Hong Kong is still under international uh, mo uh, mo uh, monitor and observe on it. But more important and critical issue is about the regulation of anti-subversion. It seems to be common around the world, but uh, according to the definition of Beijing, uh, anti-subversion uh, means that uh, targeted anyone criticizing President Xi in China. And uh, if the anti-subversion regulation implied in Hong Kong, anyone on social media criticized on President Xi Jinping, uh, criticized on Communist Party of China, might result in being arrested, tortured, uh, prosecuted, and locked up in prison in China instead of Hong Kong. So speech crime will be exist in Hong Kong soon. Okay, I know we're getting up against the clock here, so a couple quick questions for you. Um, let's talk about, you, you mentioned the, the, the extradition, and now we have the new security law. Kind of break maybe that down from your perspective. What are some of the big concerns about the new security measures? Uh, with such new security me me measure, it's not about the security of the, uh, of the country. It's about the security and people loyalty to a uh, communist regime. So we hope to explain how Beijing provided a misleading narrative and to mobilize as many people as we can to have a uh, labor strike, class boycotts, and protests on street, and also keep our momentum on global community and encourage the world to stand with Hong Kong. Yeah, and, and so one of the things that, that um, my work with the Bush China Foundation and, and stuff that I've tried to express to people is, in, in the United States, when you deal with China over here, it's China this, China that. Um, and, and, and there's not really a... A, um, a good popular message, at least, that you have the political elite, you, know, you have the Communist Party, uh, then you have, obviously, Hong Kong, Taiwan, which we didn't get into, um, but then you just have the regular folk who may have a wide-ranging opinion 
of what they think about the, the, the policies in China, but they're not able to speak out. Um, so kind of break down for me, for folks who haven't been to China, haven't been to Hong Kong, um, just maybe both sides of the coin here. What are some maybe some misconceptions just to kind of put some texture on 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 the on the people on the ground there from people you know the the average citizen in Hong Kong and the average citizen in China what are some things that maybe folks uh, in America don't really have a good grasp about how they think about the world or how they think, how they think about us um, because sometimes it feels like uh, if you listen to Trump or you listen to Xi it, it, it's very much a high level conversation uh, but to get part of this. Uh, goal accomplished. It feels like, at least from the uh, the American population's uh, support, um, you almost have to kind of put a face behind the name, if you will. If you will make that bond, and um, and right now with the COVID outbreak, it's even harder to do that because you can't travel. So maybe put a little texture on uh, Chinese culture and, and and you know how you guys maybe view America or how you kind of view each other, or or, or uh, because it feels like the the message here is China this, China that, China that. And it's like, well, okay, there's a lot of folks in China that probably think <laughs> have a lot of different visions about what's going on. Uh, supporting Hong Kong is not the matter of right or left, it's the matter of right or wrong. Because uh, I think what Hong Kong people hope to safeguard is the freedom that we all uh, cherish and also the universal value that we all believe in. Uh, especially, I think what Hong Kong people hope to safeguard is the uniqueness of Hong Kong being a global city instead of just a normal city uh, under the hardline crackdown of Beijing. And Hong Kong is the place where a lot of uh, people believe in freedom and democracy, just like how uh, we try our best to mobilize as many people we, as we can have two million people uh, talk to the street in 2019 with, in such a city with only 7.5 million population. Of course, people in China with the Great Firewall and the internet censorship, it's hard for them to seek for justice. But uh, we strongly afraid that the media and internet censorship or the Great Firewall uh, on social media might imply from not only China, but also imply in Hong Kong. And that's the reason I think how important to safeguard Hong Kong right now. Okay. Leave us with this. We're going to link to obviously your Twitter profile. Um, give us a few good news outlets or sources that maybe that are kind of on the ground that folks can, um, can look up, they can follow along, whether it's a, a Twitter account or a, or a website, a news outlet, um, just something. So if folks want to know kind of what's going yeah. on the ground, because when you go to Chinese media, you're not sure exactly which ones you can trust. Yeah, especially the South China Morning Post, one of the uh, uh, popular media in Hong Kong is controlled by Jack Ma, uh, one of the pro-Beijing businessmen. And I strongly recommend people, apart from following my Twitter, Joshua Wong CF, uh, it will be great to read the news from Hong Kong Free Press, one of the... Uh, a media outlet that upholding uh, freedom of press and universal value that we all believe in. Okay, Hong Kong Free Press, and we will link to your Twitter profile. Obviously, you have a book, um, Unfree Speech, The Great uh, the Threat to Global Democracy and Why We Must Act Now. Um, we will link to that in the show notes for people to check out. Um, Joshua, we pulled this together pretty quickly, so I thank you for getting to me. Uh, this is obviously an important event. Uh, we want people to be free and to live and to you know go and do their lives and um, not be fear of tyranny. So uh, we wish you the best of luck. What is the next milestone we should be looking for as we um, – follow what's going on thank you yeah I, i'm sorry yeah is there one more what's the next milestone we should be looking for um a, a, as we follow okay, this so uh next week is the tenement square uh massacre anniversary and it will be a critical time for us mobilized people get on street again on june 4th yeah okay june 4th all right we will put that date on the calendar we will be following it um obviously here in the war room We'll be covering that as well. Joshua, thank you so much for your time, um, and best of luck to you guys uh, in Hong Kong, and we wish you the, nothing but the best. Thank you. Thanks for your invitation. 